Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. My name is uh, Luciano Garrido. I'm Executive Director of Business Development at uh, UHealth International. Thank you for participating in today's health series presentation focused on cardiology. Today's topic in a, is advancements in atrial fibrillation, improving patient outcomes. This evening, we have an excellent panel of expert cardiologists from the University of Miami, led by Dr. Jeffrey Goldberger. Our experts will discuss, discuss several topics related to atrial fibrillation and answer your questions during the presentation at the end. Let me introduce the, the panelists. First, we have Dr. Jeffrey Goldberger. He's Professor of Medicine and Cardiology Division Chief, and he will be presenting today Novo Approaches for Atrial Fibrillation. We also have another excellent expert, Dr. Raul Mitrani. He's Professor of Medicine and Director of Clinical Cardiac Electrophysiology. Dr. Mitrani will present catheter ablation for persistent atrial fibrillation. And finally, we have our last expert today, Dr. Alex Velasquez. He's Assistant Professor of Medicine an expert on clinical cardiac electrophysiology. Dr. Velasquez will present thromboembolic stroke prophylaxis, a tailored approach. Before we start the presentations, let us review some of the meeting rules very quickly. First, the audience microphones have been muted to minimize meeting disruptions. Second, we will have the possibility of answering a poll during the meeting to select an answer to one of the experts' questions. So please stay tuned for that because you will be required to actually answer that question. We'll do a vote, like a poll. And number three, participants will also be able to ask questions during the meeting using the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, our experts will answer as many questions as possible during and after the presentation. So we will try to get to all of you, and if we cannot get to all, we will make sure to answer your questions via email. Again, thank you for joining us today, and without further delay, let me introduce to you our first expert panelist, Dr. Jeffrey Goldberger. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luciano. Uh, thank you to all our participants who have joined us today from far and near. We're so delighted uh, to have this opportunity to open this conversation uh, with you and to discuss uh, some of our uh, ideas about uh, atrial fibrillation. So the questions that I'd like to consider in our uh, initial talk here are, what is atrial fibrillation? What is atrial myopathy? And then the important question, do we treat the atrial fibrillation the atrial myopathy, or both. So first, we'll deal with what is atrial fibrillation. Now, many of us will recognize the undulating uh, atrial activation that we see in atrial fibrillation, typical on the electrocardiogram. Here you see four different patients' uh, electrocardiograms from V1, uh, show, all showing atrial fibrillation. Uh, and it, despite the fact that they all show atrial fibrillation, they are all quite different. So for example, if we look at this first one, I have a box drawn here. You can actually count the number of fibrillatory waves that are within this box, and there are five. If we go to this patient's ECG, same size box, there are only three fibrillatory waves in this box. So do these patients have the same atrial fibrillation or are there differences that we need to note? Obviously, we also see the much more organized pattern of the fibrillatory waves in the CCG and the much larger amplitude than you see over here. And we can do the same kind of analysis for uh, over here. We see three fibrillatory waves, and in this patient, we see only two fibrillatory waves in this box. So the question is, what do these mean and how do we interpret this in the setting of atrial fibrillation? Now, We've tried to classify atrial fibrillation in many different ways. The typical classification that we use on the ECG is coarse versus fine atrial fibrillation. But again, we're not really sure what that means. 
there's primary versus secondary atrial fibrillation. So for example, atrial fibrillation that you might see after someone has bypass surgery is secondary atrial fibrillation. Once they recover from their bypass surgery, the atrial fibrillation is no longer a clinical problem. We also classify by type, whether it's paroxysmal, persistent, or chronic, by symptoms, whether it's silent or symptomatic, by the type of heart disease, whether it's lone atrial fibrillation or whether there's structural heart disease. And finally, we also have autonomic classifications, for example, vagal atrial fibrillation. And really, aside from this last one, none of these classifications really tell us much about the underlying pathophysiology for the atrial fibrillation. Even if we want to discuss mechanisms for atrial fibrillation, we have a lot of disparities and a lot of different types of mechanisms that may be responsible for atrial fibrillation. This is a cartoon that was published in 2007 by Hugh Hawkins, and we're looking at the back of the left atrium, and you see the pulmonary veins entering the left atrium here. And what he depicts in this cartoon are the multiple different mechanisms that are potentially responsible for atrial fibrillation. So these asterisks here could be focal firing from the pulmonary veins. You can see here re-entry around the pulmonary veins, these things that look like rotors, these yellow areas that are autonomic ganglia. And the fact is when there are so many mechanisms that we think may be responsible for atrial fibrillation, it's also a good indicator that we really don't know for sure. So there are many things that we really don't know about atrial fibrillation. And the question is, does it matter? Does it make a difference if we don't know any of these things? And certainly when it comes to the diagnostic evaluation for atrial fibrillation, this is very well characterized, and this is what's been published in the 2014 guidelines and has not changed in the 2019 update. And we all know the initial diagnostic evaluation for a patient with atrial fibrillation is a history and physical examination, ECG, an echocardiogram, and blood tests for thyroid, uh, renal, and hepatic function. Now, although this is a very well characterized diagnostic evaluation, I think it's important for us to note that this diagnostic evaluation has not changed in over 30 years. This is exactly the same diagnostic evaluation we performed 30 years ago. And to think that we don't have any advances in our diagnostics for atrial fibrillation is almost a little bit embarrassing. Just compare it to the advancement in diagnostics that we have in oncology and look at all of the therapeutic implications that those diagnostics have enabled. We are, I think, at the frontier of developing those diagnostics and new therapeutic capabilities. So I'd like to move on and talk about what is atrial myopathy. And atrial myopathy is no different than ventricular myopathy. It has to do with atrial dilatation, atrial dysfunction, and atrial fibrosis. And all these are potentially important issues in relationship to atrial fibrillation. So the way I like to think about atrial fibrillation, and this comes from a publication that will be coming out very shortly uh, from our group in the Arrhythmia and Electrophysiology Review, um, is atrial fibrillation is a disease much like coronary disease. Although we see somebody manifest with coronary disease over here late in time, there's a long timeline for development of the disease prior to its clinical manifestation. So somebody who has a myocardial infarction, for example, that's not the first day that they have coronary disease. It's been decades of buildup that's led to the myocardial infarction. And the same may be true with atrial fibrillation. This may be the manifestation, or stroke may be the clinical manifestation, but the underlying disease in the atrium, and remember, the atrium is the, is the chamber that's now responsible for generating atrial fibrillation, has also been ongoing for many years, perhaps even decades. So if we think about the normal atrium, it has no disease, the variety of different mediators like aging, epicardial adipose tissue, oxidative stress, inflammation, pressure and volume overload that lead to the fibrosis, the dilatation, and atrial dysfunction. This is initially subclinical and not detectable, but over time this builds up and we might have a preclinical atrial fibrillation substrate so that we can actually detect these changes 
but we don't yet have either atrial fibrillation or stroke. And our, you're going to hear a little bit from Dr. Mitrani about the treatment of atrial fibrillation with catheter ablation and the treatment of stroke from Dr. Velasquez. But we actually would prefer to be able to prevent those complications by treating earlier. And in order to treat earlier, we have to have better methods to identify the atrial myopathy. So there are many methods that have been proposed and are around to evaluate. I'm certainly not going to go through all of them, but I just want to give you a couple examples. One of the methods is an electrocardiographic method, looking at the P-terminal force in lead V1, and you can see this deep negative P wave in V1, and this has been shown to be associated with atrial fibrillation. Uh, this comes from work from the University of Utah to looking at cardiac MRI evaluation of left atrial fibrosis. In blue is the normal tissue. So again, we're looking at the back of the left atrium with the pulmonary veins over here. You can see in this patient, there's very little uh, green, which represents the fibrosis. And then there are various stages of increasing fibrosis. So you see over here where you have over 35% of the left atrium shows evidence of delayed enhancement consistent with fibrosis. So there are some tools that will be being developed to be able to uh, evaluate left atrial fibrosis. This is another methodology taken from the electrophysiology laboratory. So this is a, a invasive and requires placing a catheter in the left atrium and actually measuring the voltage of the signal in the left atrium at various different sites. And the voltage scale here is red is very low and purple is normal, blue and purple. You can see in this patient, again, looking at the very back of the left atrium with the pulmonary veins coming out over here, most of the back of the left atrium shows low voltage with only a few areas showing normal voltage. So again, this patient would be classified as having significant atrial myopathy. And in fact, there are many other techniques that can be used to evaluate the atrium in, in the left atrium in particular in patients with atrial fibrillation. We talked about this ECG. There are biomarkers that can be used. We showed a little bit about cardiac MRI for measuring fibrosis, but we are also using cardiac MRI to look at left atrial flow velocities. So we can actually me measure the flow velocity through the left atrium. We can use CT or other techniques to measure epicardial fat around the left atrium. And finally, there are advanced echo techniques to look at left atrial strain. So which of these techniques is the most important and the most relevant, and also which are, which are most reversible, um, is still unknown. So the next uh, question I'd like to address is, do we treat the atrial fibrillation, the atrial myopathy, or both? And now I'd like to ask a question to the audience. Which of the following are established treatments for atrial myopathy? Amiodarone, digoxin, diltiazem, catheter ablation, or weight loss? Please don't be shy. Please uh, go ahead and vote. It's nice to share this with everybody. All right, I see there's still some stragglers waiting to vote. You can guess too, it's okay. All right, we'll give it another few seconds and then we'll go ahead and look at the poll results. Okay, so we have a nice distribution here of, of results. Fortunately, nobody thinks diltiazem uh, reverses uh, atrial myopathy. A lot of people think that catheter ablation reverses atrial myopathy, and next is weight loss, and, the, and third is amiodarone. So I'm going to now show you some information uh, that I hope will be eye-opening to many of you. Uh, and in fact, catheter ablation, turns out, does not really reverse atrial myopathy. Consider that 
that atrial myopathy is mostly due to atrial fibrosis. Catheter ablation actually creates more atrial fibrosis. And the more ablation that you do, the more fibrosis you get. So paradoxically, it actually seems to add to the underlying myopathy. So now I want to focus on what really does reverse atrial myopathy, and that's weight loss. So this is a slide from a study called Reverse AF that was done in Australia. And they looked at the effects of weight loss on atrial fibrillation. And they divide their population into three groups. Group one had less than 3% weight loss. Group two had 3 to 9% weight loss. And group three had over 10% weight loss. So you can see the distribution at baseline between paroxysmal and persistent atrial fibrillation. And there are a little over 100 patients per group. These patients were, uh, all had BMIs uh, that were over 27, average about 33, and they were followed for four years, and they had a variety of other treatments as well. But let's look at what happens in follow-up. So in purple, we have patients who progressed from paroxysmal to persistent atrial fibrillation. So this would be progression of their atrial fibrillation. In the very little weight loss group, almost half progressed. In the middle weight loss group, about a third progressed. And in the high weight loss group, very few progressed. Persistent to paroxysmal. So now this is backwards regression. In the low weight loss group, there's almost nobody who had backwards regression. In the middle weight loss group, you have 17%. And then almost twice as many, or a little over twice as many, in the high weight loss group. Now let's look at the AF free. So these are people who no longer had atrial fibrillation. And that's here in the gray. You could see 25%, 32%, and then 52% in the high weight loss group. So again, showing a dose-dependent effect of weight loss on the underlying atrial fibrillation and presumably the atrial substrate. This is again, I think, mind boggling. This is now looking at the patients who had total freedom from atrial fibrillation. So this is a combination of weight loss and whatever other therapies they, they used. And you can see here that in the low weight loss, 39%, middle 67%, high weight loss, 86% were atrial fibrillation free. And you might think that maybe these patients had more atrial, more atrial fibrillation ablation. But in fact, they had less. We look here at the number of patients that had no atrial fibrillation ablation, 13% here, 22% here, 45 and percent here. So again, very strong evidence that these patients are doing better and it's not because they're getting more ablation. So this is a randomized clinical trial from the same study group looking at 150 patients where they had BMIs over 27, symptomatic atrial fibrillation, and they did an intervention group of physician-led weight loss versus a control group of self-directed lifestyle measures. And what you see here in this panel is when they did a physician-directed weight loss program, you had a much greater reduction in BMI than when they did not have a physician-directed program. But most importantly, look at the symptom severity score and symptom burden score. The atrial fibrillation severity and symptom scores are much better in patients who have physician-directed program to lose weight. And a lot of this really has to do, I think, due to the weight loss leads to reduction in obviously fat throughout the body, but there's also epicardial fat that lies right on the atrium. And this Atrial epicardial fat can secrete adipocytokines that has been shown uh, in clinical studies to lead to atrial fibrillation. We also know that after catheter ablation, epicardial fat is a significant predictor of outcomes. The more epicardial fat, the worse the outcomes after atrial fibrillation ablation. One of our uh, faculty members here at the university is an expert in, in epicardial fat and in, and in its treatment. And he studied a drug called liraglutide and compared it to metformin in terms of its reduction of epicardial fat. So you could see on this slide that liraglutide 
has a much greater reduction in epicardial fat at three months and at six months an even greater reduction. So this is a, an actually a therapeutic agent that we might consider for atrial fibrillation to reduce epicardial fat. And that brings us to the LEAF study. This is a study that is sponsored by the National Institutes of Health and that we are conducting here at the University of Miami. We're the only site in the United States to be doing this. And the patients that we are considering for this trial are patients who have persistent atrial fibrillation, BMI is over 27, and who are undergoing catheter ablation for treatment of their atrial fibrillation. The study design is very simple. Patients get randomized to one of two groups, either risk factor modification, as done by the Australians, or risk factor modification plus liraglutide. We do a three-month run-in period before the ablation, then the patients have ablation, and then we follow them for up to a year. We do a variety of testing to look at the effects of the drug on biomarkers and on the atrial epicardial fat. The risk factor modification program is very simple. It's really weight management and exercise, controlling hyperlipidemia, sleep apnea, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, and alcohol. Those are things that we should be doing for our patients. And just as the uh, final slide to give you a little bit of some preliminary data from our study, uh, this is just looking at the change in weight at three months. If you look at the risk factor modification group, they lose a little bit over a kilo, kilogram, whereas risk, risk factor modification plus liraglutide loses almost seven kilograms in that three-month period. And I can tell you we've seen some dramatic effects on atrial fibrillation as well, but it's too early to say uh, anything final. So we hope that this will become a new therapeutic approach to treatment of atrial fibrillation. Thank you for your attention. And at this point, I'd like to uh, bring forward Dr. Raul Mitrani, the director of our cardiac electrophysiology laboratory and program, uh, to talk about catheter ablation for persistent atrial fibrillation. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, buenos, buenas tardes to all my friends in Latin America. Going to be talking about uh, ablation for persistent atrial fibrillation. Ablation has been one of our therapies for AFib for for about 20 25 years. So this is a slide that is likely familiar to all of you, and it's a slide comparing medication therapy versus antiarrhythmic therapy versus medications for rate control. And this is the famous AFFIRM trial, which was done during the late 1990s. And it showed no mortality benefit or no benefit for a combined endpoint of mortality, stroke, major bleed, heart attack, using a strategy of rhythm control, which was basically amiodarone and some sodalol versus a strategy of rate control. So th this trial, we think, has been misunderstood. Some people have interpreted this trial to mean that rate control is just as good as rhythm control. Many patients don't tolerate the atrial fibrillation. So if they don't tolerate atrial fibrillation, you have to try to get them into sinus rhythm. The other issue is rhythm control, at least with amiodarone and sodalol, is far from perfect. At any given time, 50 or 60% of patients in rhythm control were in sinus, which means 40% were in AFib. Whereas in rate control, not everyone was in AFib all the time. About a third of the patients at any given time were in sinus because they had paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So a post hoc analysis of the AFFIRM trial showed that if you take patients in sinus rhythm, whether or not they were in atrial fibrillation, whether or not they were treated with antiarrhythmic drugs such as amiodarone, versus uh, rate control drugs, those patients did much better. So the suggestion from the post hoc analysis was that sinus rhythm is better for patients. However, we just don't know how to get to sinus rhythm in a very reliable way, in a way that avoids toxicities of medications like amiodarone. 
So in our 2000s, ablation for atrial fibrillation started. Much of that was pulmonary vein ablation using radio frequency catheters. It's done all over the world. I know it's done in South America. And what these studies have uniformly shown is that ablation is better than drug therapy at getting patients to sinus rhythm. So multiple studies show the same thing, and we'll be talking about the Cabana trial a little bit later in my talk. Cryo balloon was approved in the United States about eight years ago, and it's also very effective at keeping patients in sinus rhythm compared to drug therapy. So far, I've been talking only about paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. All these studies were in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. This was a study also in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So by about 10 years ago, it was recognized that ablation is pretty good therapy for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. However, it just wasn't as good for persistent atrial fibrillation. Much of the reason has to do with what Dr. Goldberger was talking about, that we're dealing with patients with atrial myopathy. And atrial myopathy could be a progressive disease. That's why his study, the LEAF study, which we're participating in, is a great study because it tries to stop the progression of the atrial myopathy. But I tell patients that ablation is like a stent for coronary disease. If you don't treat the underlying risk factors, they're going to have atrial fibrillation in the future. Just like coronary disease, you have to treat with cholesterol and other risk factor matters. So starting a few years ago, um, some of the studies were focusing on harder outcomes, not just whether the patients were in sinus rhythm or not, but whether they survived longer, whether they had fewer hospitalizations. The CASTLE study was a landmark study that came out that compared ablation versus medical therapy in patients who had low ejection fraction heart failure. There were 363 patients. The ejection fraction to get into the study was 30. 5% or less, the median was 32%. 30% of the patients had paroxysmal AFib, 70% had persistent atrial fibrillation. They all received implantable defibrillators, including resynchronization therapy, and it was a mean age of 64 years. So what we see here is that ablation therapy outperformed medical therapy, not only in keeping patients in sinus rhythm, because we, all, we already know that ablation is better than the medications for sinus rhythm, but actually achieving a hard outcome. And that is in this particular case, patients had fewer deaths or hospitalizations for worsening heart failure. Moreover, in the same study, they looked at the out endpoint of death from any cause. And what we see here is that for the first two, three years, the mortality rate was about the same in both groups. But then as we got into years three, four, and five, ablation offered a definite advantage in terms of survival. So this is one of the first studies to actually show that in patients with low ejection fraction and atrial fibrillation, whether it's persistent or paroxysmal, that ablation will give patients not only better quality of life, but possibly also longer life. So this brings us to the Cabana study. Incidentally, usually these three talks take three hours, so we're really condensing it to a short time. But we're, we're, free to, we're happy to answer any questions that may come up either during this, this uh, webinar or afterwards. And uh, the Cabana study was the largest study, and we were one of the study sites. And it was an international study all over the world of uh, patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, persistent atrial fibrillation, or even patients with longstanding persistent atrial fibrillation. And what they showed was in the intention to treat arm that the primary endpoint of death, disabling stroke, serious bleeding, or cardiac arrest um, was not significantly different between ablation or drug therapy. Now, there was much controversy over the statistics performed in this study. And as many of you know, intention to treat is the most rigorous um, statistical analysis that can be made. But there were some problems with this particular analysis as it pertains to this study, which we'll get into. If you look at the endpoint of first recurrence of atrial fibrillation, again, 
whether patients had persistent or paroxysmal AFib, their freedom from recurrence of AFib was much higher, significantly higher than patients treated with medicines. The hazard ratio was 0 0.5. So patients with ablation had a twofold higher chance of staying in sinus rhythm. So when I have patients come to me, whether they have persistent AFib or paroxysmal, I tell them their chances of being in sinus rhythm is much higher with ablation in general. That doesn't mean we rush to do ablation in everyone. We're not like that. And certainly we treat a lot of patients with medications. But the data are what the data are. And, and we don't shy away from using data to try to help our patients make the best decision for them. If we look at burden of atrial fibrillation, so this doesn't only look at first recurrence, but looks at how much AFib patients were having. So we see here in patients with paroxysmal AFib, the average burden was about 20% before they enrolled in the study. Then they were treated with medications or ablation. The red is in the ablation. We see the burden was much higher for much of the study in patients who had ablation for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And then if we look at the patients with persistent or long-standing persistent AFib, the burden was 69%. You may ask, why isn't it 100%? Well, some of these patients may have been cardioverted beforehand, so that would skew the statistics a little bit. But we see that after enrollment and treatment, the patients with ablation, again, had significantly lower burden in the 10% range compared to patients who were treated with medication. If you look at the subgroup analysis, I'm not going to go through all this, and I know it's small. I just want to focus your attention on, on a couple of subgroups. One is age, and we see that in, in the Caban trial, even using the intention to treat analysis, that there was a hazard ratio of 0 0.52 that those patients tended to benefit more from ablation in the primary endpoint of death, disabling stroke, bleeding, et cetera. In patients who are older, it seemed that, you know, maybe ablation may not be the best for, option for them, especially if they're not having symptoms. And then patients in the intermediate age between 65 and 75, it, it would have to be a discussion with the patient and see what they want. Interestingly, in this study, and you may not be able to see it as well, but patients with a uh, class two or greater heart failure seem to do better. So this is consistent with the results of the CASEL study, which we just presented. So if we look at the primary outcome using a different statistic, and the statistic is actually treatment received. So what happened was about 1,100 patients were randomized to ablation, and about 1,100 patients were randomized to drug therapy. About 100 of the patients, or about 10%, or 110 patients, randomized to receive ablation, never had ablation. And most of those, most of those patients were, were in other countries. And it's a little confusing to me why they were randomized if they weren't going to get ablation. As it turns out, they were randomized to ablation, and there were insurance issues, and patients didn't want to pay for the ablation. So they stayed in the study, even though they didn't receive ablation. Well, how can you compare ablation to medicines if 10% of your patients who were randomized to ablation didn't even receive the therapy? So they did analysis based on treatment received. So the patients who had ablation were in the ablation group. And similarly, many patients who were in the drug arm therapy eventually crossed over about 20%, 20-25% and had ablation because of failure of medicine. So using this statistic, we see that the primary outcome of death, disabling stroke, major bleed, MI, et cetera, was much better in the ablation group. It was 7% versus 10.9% in the drug group, which gives a hazard ratio of 0 0.67, p-value 0 0.006. And if we look at just all-cause mortality, we see that it was 4.4% versus 7.5%, again, uh, uh, significant. So there was like a debate for a year after the Cabana trial stopped, whether, you know, which is the best statistic. Eventually it was published and it showed multiple statistical analyses. I think the truth probably lies in between intention to treat and treatment received. But certainly if you, 
certainly there's a strong case to be made that if you're going to compare ablation to drug therapy, the patients, the ablation group, at least need to get ablation. Otherwise, you're really diluting the results. And then, and then this is per protocol of patients. This is just comparing the patients who receive drug therapy versus patients who received ablation. And again, this is significant. The ablation arm did better for the primary therapy. Uh, Endpoint of death, disabling stroke, serious bleeding, or cardiac arrest. So what is ablation? So I'm going to finish the last few minutes of my talk. Ablation is when we isolate the pulmonary veins. <clears throat> and we see here a catheter uh, with electrodes recording electrical potentials. The red represents tissue that has no electrical potential. This is what we typically see after an ablation. The pulmonary veins, most people have four pulmonary veins are isolated and there's no electrical potentials. The rest of the atrium is like purple, which is nice, uh, nice um, healthy tissue. The other technique we have is to do cryo balloon. This is the left atrium. This is a balloon in the left atrium. We're actually plugging up a pulmonary vein and we freeze around the pulmonary veins. And that's a, that's a way we like to use. We think it's a little bit more efficient, maybe a tad more safer than using radio frequency catheter, but we certainly can use either technique. And what we look for, if you just, this is complicated slide, so let me focus your attention. The top four uh, uh, lines are EKGs and you see bursts of atrial fibrillation. And just focus on the green. These are the bursts of atrial fibrillation as we see it within the pulmonary vein. And when we completely isolate the pulmonary vein, you see the green becomes flat line. So I know we don't like to see flat line on EKG, but trust me, the EKG is not flat line. The EKG is sinus rhythm, but we like to see flat line in the pulmonary veins. So that means the pulmonary vein is completely isolated. And you see the instant we isolated it, the patient went into sinus rhythm. So this is what we like to see. We don't always see clean pictures like this, but this is like the endpoint. So the conundrum is that with pulmonary vein isolation, it achieves about 75% success at keeping patients AFib free. And of course, what Dr. Goldberger talked about is very important, that you have to work on the risk factors, otherwise they'll come back. But for persistent or chronic AFib, it's only about 50-50 effective. So what we're going to do about persistent AFib, the one procedure success rate is 40 to 60%. Maybe we could do a second, some people do a third. Um, but, you know, what can we do? There are multiple strategies proposed to improve the AFib free survival. Maybe we have to blade other spots. This was a study in New England Journal of Medicine. They compared pulmonary vein isolation with ablation of certain signals in the atrium, which told them maybe these, these are signals that are driving the AFib, or maybe make linear lesions and make anatomic barriers. So this study, they were looking to see if they can improve the success rate of persistent AFib ablation. And this study was negative in that no strategy was better than pulmonary vein ablation, pulmonary vein isolation by itself. So this is AFib-free survival. We, we use a three-month blanking period. And we see that <coughs> the, ancillary, the ancillary ablation lesion sets actually made it perhaps a little bit worse. But it was not significant, so we have to say they were all about the same. By 12 months, they were all about the same. So this is also from Dr. Calkins for persistent AFib. He recommends maybe do a pulmonary vein isolation. And this is our strategy as well also. It's not just his strategy. Sometimes we do consider additional ablation lesions, depending if we find a lot of areas with low voltage, which means the scar tissue, which is what Dr. Goldberger talked about. If, if they come back for a second procedure, we try to wait. We'd verify if the veins are still isolated. Oftentimes, there's some breakthrough in the veins and we'll re-isolate the veins. But this is when we look harder at other ablation lesions. So here at the University of Miami, under the leadership of Dr. Goldberger, we actually have a protocol where we actually try to make sense of this chaotic AFib signals. These are signals in the atrium. It looks very chaotic. How are we going to make sense of this? When we have signals that look regular, this we can deal with. We can map this and find out where this is coming from. 
So um, with Dr. Goldberger and others, they derived uh, mathematical algorithms to try to see if there's any regularity in these signals. And we test signals all over the atrium to see if we can have fast repeatable uh, morphologies, which might be a clue to where atrial fibrillation is coming from or being sustained. And we actually generate these little maps, which kind of tell us if it's all red, the hot spots where we might ablate AFib. So we actually have a couple of protocols for persistent AFib, which I think might be helpful to patients who are coming in for ablation for persistent atrial fibrillation. So I just want to conclude that catheter ablation is well-established therapy for patients with paroxysmal AFib as a first or second line therapy. Catheter ablation for, atri for patients with persistent AFib is reasonable and more likely to result in rhythm maintenance than medications. However, future research, and we're doing some of that here, is needed to clarify which patients may require catheter ablation lesion sets beyond pulmonary vein isolation. So it's my honor now to present Dr. Alex Velasquez, who we trained and he joined us a couple of years ago. If you talk to him or email with him, I assure you he's a rising star and you're gonna hear a lot of great things about him and from him over the ensuing years. Alex? Let me unmute myself. Hello. All right. Um, Hello everyone, good evening. I'm gonna start this. Um, all right, so I'm gonna talk about uh, strategies um, or tailored approach for thromboembolic stroke prevention in patients with atrial fibrillation. Um, so, so many of us know uh, who uh, with atrial fibrillation require um, require anticoagulation for thromboembolic stroke prophylaxis. In general, patients with atrial fibrillation and a chance to vast score of two in men or three or greater in women uh, require some form of anticoagulation, including warfarin, dabigatrin, um, rivaroxaban, apixaban, or doxaban. These are many options available to us these days uh, for anticoagulation and the uh, direct oral anticoagulants are now preferred due to the ease of administration and um, good safety profile. However, um, the renal function and hepatic function of our patients have to be evaluated before we start these agents and uh, regularly re-evaluated to make sure that no dose adjustments or contraindications have developed um, during therapy. So in patients who develop chronic kidney disease or already have chronic kidney disease, atrial fibrillation is often coexistent, much because the, the uh, conditions and the risk factors for atrial fibrillation often also lead to um, chronic kidney disease. And actually atrial fibrillation may accelerate the progression of chronic kidney disease to end-stage renal disease. Um, and, even though CKD is an independent risk factor for um, thrombosis, paradoxically, it also uh, increases the risk of hemorrhage. And that can be through a variety of mechanisms, including um, dysfunctional uh, platelet uh, synthesis, platelet function, and aggregation. Um, also, patients with CKD or end-stage renal disease are at excess exposed to um, bleeding by way of um, heparin use during hemodialysis, uh, catheterization uh, for dialysis, and uh, the formation of AV fistulas as well. Um, and we can evaluate a, pa a general patient's risk of bleeding with um, risk various risk scores, including the HASBLED, atria, orbit. There's a, there's a wide variety, but their utility really comes down to uh, directing treatment of modifiable risk factors. Um, not necessarily identifying a person who is uh, contraindicated for uh, anticoagulation, but control of hypertension, reducing alcohol consumption, and then um, if a patient has label INRs, switching them to a DOAC agent um, can reduce the risk of bleeding in a general population. However, these scores don't, are, are not necessarily validated in patients who uh, 
have uh, dialysis needs or se more severe forms of CKD. Um, the drug that has the best experience or the, the more established um, profile of patients in CKD is warfarin. And, but however, it was only really established in patients with stage three CKD. So stage four in CKD and end stage renal disease, there's actually no um, randomized controlled trial to support the use of warfarin. Much of the data we have nowadays is retrospective cohort data, um, and much of that is um, conflicting. So the DOAX, um, or the NOAX, whichever one you want to call it, um, they have some data to support their use, but it's mostly pharmacokinetic. Again, um, these drugs were uh, excluded, or patients with end-stage renal disease and severe form of CKD um, were excluded from the tr uh, trials for these drugs. And so the, the data we have to use to direct our use of these drugs is actually just based on pharmacokinetic data. Now, the, the drug that has the, the most favorable profile for end-stage renal disease is uh, apixagan because it has the lowest clearance for, by re for renal function. Um, However, it has its disadvantage in that it's the least dialyzable. So if a patient has a complication on apixaban, it's the one that we can't dialyze um, and we just have to wait for it to reverse. Um, it also doesn't have a, um, a, an established antidote at this time. The only drug that does um, is dabigatran at this point. Okay, so when we're choosing a drug, um, we also have to determine if any dose adjustment needs to be made. So it's, this is a complicated slide, um, and I, th I think in clinical practice, it creates a lot of confusion. So a pixaban, even though it, you can use five milligrams BID throughout the whole spectrum of uh, creatinine clearances, its dose has to be adjusted when one of the other two factors are, are present. So if a patient is greater than 80 years old or the body weight is less than 60 and you have CKD, you have to reduce the dose. Now, um, the other drugs, uh, they have varying levels of, of reduc uh, at which point you reduce it. So rivaroxaban at, at 50 uh, milliliters per minute, you reduce the dose to uh, 15 milligrams daily. Dabigatran, you reduce it once you get to 30 milliliters per minute. And endoxaban, um, you reduce it when you get to 50. Now, endoxaban also has the added uh, complication that above 90, uh, five milliliters per minute, you have to, uh, you can't use it because it, because it's renally cleared so well, you have under protection by this drug when um, the patient's cranial clearance is that high. Okay. Um, this, th that, as this, con this uh, slide was so complicated, um, we find that when, when patients have CKD, they're actually oftentimes overdosed. Um, depending on the drug, the, the experience is different, but um, patient, a certain proportion of patients who, who qualify for reduction actually still get treated with standard doses. And then um, you also have the opposite. Certain uh, select populations of, uh, of patients who would require standard doses actually get over underdosed. And, it, and this slide, um, I'd highlight that Patients over 80 seem to have the highest proportion of, patient, of uh, underdosing across the board. And I think that's partly because the, the clinicians are more uh, alert and um, concerned about other comorbidities that may expose them, the patient to a higher risk of bleeding, such as falls or frailty. And so underdosing is more likely to um, be done at that point. Okay. In patients with end-stage renal disease, the trial data is limited. There's not much uh, to support uh, the use of any anticoagulant. However, uh, there's a larger experience with warfarin. A majority of patients who are anticoagulated with end-stage renal disease are anticoagulated with warfarin. In 2015, there was an uptrend to the use of apixaban. I think nowadays you probably see more patients with apixaban use. But when they looked at this, um, the results or the outcomes of these patients on apixaban and warfarin, the patients selected to be on apixaban seem to have lower rates of stroke 
and they also had lower rates of major bleeding. Now that's when they when a Pixaban five milligrams BID was used. Um, whether this was a selection bias or whether this is a true effect of a Pixaban, it cannot be determined from these studies. And actually, without randomized controlled trials, it's going to be difficult to decipher. Um, however, we can say from this trial that the experience for those selected to be on a Pixaban is comparable to the the experience of those on warfarin, um, if not better, but we can't really be clear, uh, sure about that. Um, from the European perspective, they don't recommend any drug be used down uh, at the severe stages of CKD uh, re requiring dialysis. And they, they quote that um, randomized controlled trial or the absence of, of the randomized controlled trials um, does not uh, support the use of any drug there. Um, so there was one randomized controlled trial that was presented recently at AHA um, where they tried to answer this question. They randomized patients to a Pixaban or Warfarin. About 30% of patients who received a Pixaban were on the reduced dose, 2.5 milligrams twice daily. And the outcome seemed to be on the surface similar as far as bleeding, intracranial bleeding, um, stroke, and cardiovascular death on the surface. However, the, the trial was initially intended to include 760 patients, and they were only able to randomize 154. So it's a gross underpowering of, of um, this question. Um, not only that, the, the, the patients in the warfarin group, um, their therapeutic or their time in therapeutic range was only 44%, which is pretty low. Um, compared to uh, the general population which usually achieves around 60%. Um, what else? Yeah. So, so we can't really come to any firm conclusions about the safety and efficacy of a Pixaban based on this trial. Um, but the data does suggest that it's um, comparable to warfarin, at least in this populace. All right, so now we move on to chronic liver disease. So if you have a patient with chronic liver disease, um, the, hepatic, uh, the hepatic disease was also not included in the trial. So we have limited information to guide us when we're looking at patients with hepatic disease. Um, it also increases the chance of bleeding and uh, thrombosis uh, simultaneously by way of reducing um, uh, clotting factors and uh, reducing anticoagulant factors in the blood. So both are um, significantly reduced. Um, and when we're choosing drugs uh, for, the, for patients with hepatic disease, the one that gets metabolized almost uh, exclusively by the liver, which, which is by the way that it works, is, is warfarin. So, um, but, but nevertheless, warfarin is still one of the uh, oldest drugs, and so it has um, the longest experience for patients, even, in, even with patients with liver disease. With the newer drugs, the liver metabolism and the balance between liver metabolism and renal uh, metabolism um, varies significantly. With a Pixaban having the highest rates of uh, liver metabolism and adoxaban and dabigatrin having the fewest, um, rivaroxaban somewhere in between. Um, but this is about as much information as we have currently to support the use of, of um, these drugs in patients with liver disease. So in, when you're looking at a patient with liver disease, you, you can assess their degree of severity and then determine whether or not um, the drug is appropriate. And that's pretty much about it. Um, the, the current guidelines recommend the use of uh, DOAX in patients with mild liver disease, um, but then they, they, they limit um, the recommendation um, with child pew class B to use with caution. Um, dose reduction is not necessarily recommended, but you have to assess the patient's um, risk um, of uh, falls, uh, esophageal varices, uh, bleeding, um, as well as uh, thrombosis um, to determine whether or not the patient in a child pew class B is appropriate. They do not recommend rivaroxaban at this level. And then at class C, they don't recommend any drug 
other than warfarin with uh, therapeutic INRs. Now, you oftentimes will find yourself in a situation where the INR is already two um, with liver disease, and you ask yourself, how much warfarin should I use? Um, so I'll move on now to another area where anticoagulation becomes uh, complicated, and that's where you have patients with intracranial hemorrhage or high risk of bleeding. So um, it's definitely our most feared complication of anticoagulation is a fall or um, a spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage, but it's rare. In the DOAC trials for a standard patient, um, uh, the, the, the rates of intracranial hemorrhage were between one in a, um, one in a thousand to one in uh, 200 patients. Um, and even if you have a patient who has had an intracranial hemorrhage, anticoagulation is not necessarily contraindicated. It's definitely advised to uh, discuss this with the patient and your neurologist and your neurosurgeon and come to a conclusion of whether or not um, resumption of anticoagulation is possible. But nowadays, we have an alternative to anticoagulation, um, at least for the prevention of non-valvular AF-related thromboembolism. And that comes by the way of left atrial appendage occlusion. So um, we, we, we have increasingly recognized that left atrial appendage is where most thrombus related to non-valvular AF um, originates. And so occlusion of this um, valve, um, the left atrial appendage, can reduce the event rate um, for non-valvular AAF and uh, liberate the patient from anticoagulation. Um, so in the PROTECT slash PREVAIL uh, trials, uh, they, they tried to answer the question when they compared uh, left atrial appendage occlusion to warfarin, whether or not um, ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, um, non uh, cardiovascular death was changed. When in, in their primary composite endpoint, um, they were unable to demonstrate non-inferiority. However, uh, hemorrhagic stroke was significantly less in the patients who received uh, left atrial appendage occlusion. And then also disabling fatal strokes, which is really what we're really most worried about with anticoagulation, um, were significantly reduced with uh, left atrial appendage closure. Um, CV cardiovascular deaths were also lower. And then when they looked at all cause death and major bleeding that was non uh, procedural related, those were all reduced. So clearly, being off anticoagulations um, uh, because they had a left atrial appendage closure uh, offered the benefit that we were looking for. Um, procedural related ischemic stroke. Uh, was present, okay, um, and an overall ischemic stroke past seven days was higher in the um, device uh, arm, and so that is what ultimately leads us to this non, uh, this uh, null, or this negative result, where they didn't meet the primary outcome. Um, oh no, so so in. This study, although it didn't really meet the criteria or the criteria for non-inferiority, has shows that there is some benefit for um, left atrial appendage closure. Of note, if you refer someone for left atrial appendage closure, you have to um, make sure that uh, this patient is still a candidate for some anticoagulation because, as they saw in the evolution re registry of a thousand patients. Um, who underwent left atrial appendage closure with the Watchman device, up to 5% of these patients still developed thrombus-related, I mean, uh, device-related thrombus um, in the six weeks after uh, their procedure. This is despite uh, vitamin K antagonists, NOACs, dual antiplatelet therapy, antiplatelet therapy. They didn't find any of these to be significantly different than each other. However, uh, vitamin K antagonists were the only ones that didn't have pedunculated mobile thrombi found on the, um, on the follow-up uh, TEEs. Um, it seemed that these were not that significant, uh, clinically significant as in most of these didn't end up causing a stroke, but it's nevertheless 
um, a, a minority of these patients that were in this registry had no anticoagulation immediately after the procedure. So um, patients who have an absolute contraindication for anticoagulation, where they can't tolerate any, not even dual antiplatelet therapy, um, may not be a, a suitable candidate for a procedure like this. So in summary, dose adjustment for patients with CKD uh, is necessary. Uh, anticoagulation for patients with liver disease is uh, used with caution. And then left atrial appendage closure is definitely an option for patients who have a post uh, or who are post intracranial hemorrhage. So thank you everyone um, for your attention. And now um, I'm gonna hand this back to Dr. Goldberger who's gonna run our question and answer session. Um, I highly encourage anybody uh, who has a question to submit uh, the question through our question and answer prompt. Um, we've already received some. Great, well, thank you very much, Alex. And uh, thank you, Raul, for, uh, for great presentations. Also, before we start uh, with the question and answer, I want to make sure that we uh, thank all the individuals from the international program who really put this together and have done a wonderful job. So th thank you all. Um, so we do have a, a number of interesting questions. Uh, I'll take the first one here. Uh, it's related to the LEAF study that I spoke about. And the question is, are the effects on atrial fibrillation observed in patients treated with risk factor modification plus the raglutide attributed to the use of the medication per se or to the waste lo weight loss it produces? So that's an excellent question. Uh, this is the first clinical trial to, uh, to evaluate this. Obviously, the answer could be either way, uh, but from a, from a basic science perspective, uh, it's been shown by my colleague uh, Gianluca Acabellis that the epicardial fat actually expresses GLP-1 receptors. So there may actually be a direct effect of the liraglutide on the epicardial fat through these GLP-1 receptors. Uh, we hope we'll have some information from the study to be able to tease this out. But, you know, it's really an outstanding question. Uh, so next question uh, for Dr. Mitrani uh, is how much of a burden of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation uh, is enough to be considered for catheter ablation? So that's a great question. Uh, so... All the studies for AFib usually require two episodes within six months. I mean, not all of them, but that, that's a kind of typical. Um, I think it's something you have to discuss with your patient. You have to see how the atrial fibrillation is affecting your patient's quality of life. You have to see how the medications, if there are medications, many of them are on medications by the time they get to me, is affecting their quality of life. Um, if they had one episode of AFib, for instance, and it lasted a few hours, you know, that might be very scary for them. But generally, I don't ablate after just a single episode because we, have, we all have patients that have one episode of AFib and I don't have another episode for several years. So if I bladed every patient with one episode of AFib, my statistics would look phenomenal because a lot of them would probably do well anyway. So I try to uh, calm them down about that. So. I can't give a hard and fast answer. It's tied into their quality of life. But certainly if they have to start having enough of a burden that it's happening every week, uh, every month, you know, and uh, it's affecting their life. They can't exercise. They can't sleep. It wakes them up from sleep. It's something that's worthwhile doing. If they're in persistent atrial fibrillation, even if it's new, I talked to them about the Cabana trial, especially if they're young that there's some benefits that they can accrue from ablation uh, other than uh, symptomatic uh, improvement of quality of life. Great, thank you. Um, so next question here is uh, for Dr. Velasquez. Uh, in the context of atrial fibrillation secondary to cardiotoxicity, is there a new scale to assess the risk of bleeding or embolic event? And I'd like to expand the question a, a, a little bit more and just if you could also comment on how good the CHADS VAS score is in terms of predicting stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. Um, so the CHADS VAS, the CHADS 2 VAS score is not that good at predicting a stroke. It's good at basically 
evaluating a patient who is not a suitable candidate for anticoagulation. So if, if we were to look at a uh, chads 2 vast score result and determine what are the chances of this patient uh, um, ending up with a stroke, um, the C statistic of the chads 2 vast score is not that good. But for a patient who has a low score, zero to one, that uh, identifying a patient who is not a suit or does not necessarily does not necess necessitate anticoagulation, um, a chas 2 vax is good. Now, um, with regards to uh, cardio cardiotoxicity, um, let me see the question again because um, I think that uh, Dr. Goldberg they were asking a different thing. Right, atrial fibrillation secondary to cardiotoxicity, I guess, any kind of type cardiotoxicity. So um, in terms of drugs, so um, assessing the risk of, uh, of stroke is increasingly recognized as uh, that, that just the, the, the traditional risk factors of a chance 2 vasc are insufficient necessarily to capture um, certain intrinsic um, myopath myopathic processes that increase the risk of stroke. So as in Gold Dr. Goldberger's uh, um, uh, slides, when you look at patients who have like a Utah uh, score of four where there's extensive uh, fibrosis, that patient, even if they don't have hypertension, diabetes, or the other traditional risk factors for a stroke, that patient may be at risk for a stroke um, independent of that. And then furthermore, um, the burden of atrial fibrillation may be also something that is not necessarily captured in um, our current chads 2 vasc uh, uh, assessments. Furthermore, um, with regards to cardiotoxicity, so if you have a patient who has severe cardiomyopathy, EFs less than 30%, those, those patients as well have an increased uh, risk of stroke maybe not necessarily from the atrial myopathy, but also from, uh, you know, development of um, ventricular thrombus as well. And so those become difficult to tease out which one is which. So, um, so current, current data um, supports the, 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 the elaboration of our current uh, assessment uh, strategies, but uh, we don't, we, I don't think that's been established what is the best strategy to determine someone's true risk of stroke and uh, bleeding. Okay, great. We'll take, uh, we'll do one last question here, and uh, this will be for both uh, Dr. Mitrani and Dr. Velasquez. Uh, oftentimes we have patients come to us and they say they want to have an ablation so that they can get off of their anticoagulants for their atrial fibrillation. What kind of patients is that kind of strategy even viable in? So we'll start first with Dr. Mitrani. So I uniformly tell the patient that coming off anticoagulation should not be the primary driver of the decision to do an ablation. Although many patients are desperate to come off anticoagulants as are their doctors, we can never be sure that they won't have recurrent AFib or they'll have recurrent AFib that's asymptomatic that can expose them to the risk. That said, for patients with CHADS scores of zero and one, where the use of anticoagulation is optional anyway, if they have an ablation and it looks good and they're not having AFib, then that seems reasonable. I, for patients who have CHADS score of two and three, if they really want to come off anticoagulation, uh, I look at their echo, I look at the left atrial size, if it looks reasonable, if it's not severely enlarged, if their heart function's normal, I'll place an implantable loop recorder. And if that doesn't show any AFib, then I, I'll agree, but it has to be a shared decision with the patient. They understand it's not a FDA valid, it's not a study valid um, choice. But on the same token, we've had a few patients that we've picked up like, some asymptomatic AFib that's super rare, but those patients agree to go back on their anticoagulation. Alex, do you want to comment? Um, yeah, I, I, I think that um, 
I take a similar approach to Dr. Mitrani in that I, I assess based on imaging um, what the nature of the atrial um, size is, um, its function. Um, if, um, if you, again, it's difficult to compare one individual to another and, and really make a judgment about this because that is limited. Um, but uh, a patient obviously with a very large left atrium that's not mobile, um, if on TEM, TEE imaging um, ahead of time in, in, on prior studies or during ablation, you see left atrial um, like smoke, as we call it, or um, you know, uh, echogenicity in the in the left atrium. That's a person that you're not going to um, consider even um, stopping their anticoagulant. Um, but a, per, a young person who has normal uh, left atrial sides, um, normal velocities in the left atrial appendage. Um, that's someone you might consider uh, to take the strategy of let's um, observe them um, with a, a loop recorder. Um, I, ha I personally have some reservations with the loop recorder because the turnaround time sometimes of these of the report and then and then you know the the, the event of the atrial fibrillation and then uh, getting back to the patient um, is not always perfect. You know, there's always there's always some pitfall that you that you can fall into. Um, but nevertheless, uh, when you look at the data for, from patients with pacemakers, um, unless the event was greater than 24 hours, um, the, there wasn't necessarily an associated risk of stroke. Um, you know, these small uh, under six minutes uh, events don't necessarily always translate to a fib. And, and really how much a fib you need to, to end up with a stroke is, is, is a question that has yet to be answered. So I think uh, if you have no AFib for a long time, um, as long as you don't have atrial myopathy underlying that's gonna expose you to a big risk, I think it, it, is, a bio, it is a possible option. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Velasquez and uh, Dr. Mitrani for a uh, great uh, question and answer. Uh, as, as Dr. Mitrani mentioned earlier, any one of the topics that we discussed today could have filled a full hour. Uh, we hope that uh, we gave you a, a brief overview uh, of our interests and, and uh, the uh, topics that we discussed. Uh, we would certainly be interested in your feedback and uh, would be happy to you know, do this uh, again if, if this is helpful uh, in more detail. Uh, so I'd like to thank everybody for their participation, uh, the uh, speakers, and again, the international program. Uh, wish you all a good evening and please stay safe.